so much, band. We appreciate you. Thank you for leading us in worship tonight. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's good to see you guys. Welcome to church. By a raise of hands, are there any of you that are here for the first time? Very welcome to you. If there's anybody else that's here for the first time and too shy to stick up their hands, welcome to you too. It's good to have you guys here. Do you guys have a good week? Yes? Like a court week? It was a short week. Did it feel short to anybody? Or was everything just like crammed into one? It felt like a, a bad week. It's good to be here with you guys. So it's my privilege to share the word with us tonight. Before we get going, I'd just like to just unlock this thing. Once again, thank you to the band, Shirley, and you guys for leading us. Before we get going, I'd like to pray for us. So if you guys can just join me in prayer. Father, thank you, Lord, for for this opportunity to, to gather here tonight in your, in your holy name, Father. Thank you, Lord, that we can know that where two or three are gathered, you are, you are there, Father. So thank you, Lord, that we can just receive your blessing on our unity tonight, Father. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'll guide us tonight. I may it be more about you and less about us. And may your spirit just dwell among us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Awesome. So tonight's title, or well, the title of tonight's sermon is Hearts Issues. And um, it might not be what you guys think it is, but I will unpack it and we'll take it from there. So, are there anybody, is there anybody in here tonight that, that had the privilege of growing up with like an allowance, so sakhelt, that like, you know, from a young age, you're like given that like 20 rand every, every Sunday, ev- Sunday evening uh, to, to put into your savings. Anybody that had like something like that? Maybe had a little job that they worked uh, on the side on weekends, uh, helping Opa in the garden or something like that. Anything, maybe selling chappies at school or um, muffins or something. I remember I used to, um, I don't know if there were some of you that joined me, that went with me in the hostel, Marlon sitting at the back there. I had a little business going there. I was, I was selling muffins. Marlon, do you remember? So I had like these chocolate muffins, um, but there was like a twist to it. But for the people that know me, know that, Myself, I, I wouldn't consume it because I don't really, I'm not really a, a sweet tooth, but I was selling that, and in the middle of these muffins, there were like these chocolate eclairs, but not fake ones, like Cadbury ones. So it was like, every, on the outside, it was this plain muffin, and then you just like were taken away by the, the moist inside. So I had that little side hustle, um, but the, I did it because I was, you know, um, raising funds to, 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 to cover the cost of my sports tours and stuff, but I remember growing up, um, also, I think it was like 10 rand or 20 rand uh, that my father and mother used to, used to give to me. I specifically remember on, on Sundays, now they, I, I had a sister, or I still have a sister. She's 16 months older than me. And we used to receive this 20 rand at the same time. Um, I fondly remember, specifically when we used to live in Clarkstop, like in the early 2000s, and receiving this 20 rand. And now between my sister and I, uh, although we are siblings, we are worlds apart regarding um, finances. So to give you a, <laughs> yeah, just like what I do and my inclination to, to, to working with that 20 rand and hers, worlds apart. You know, she's like, a, you know, money burns her, <laughs> which yeah, it's like, it's as if it, she can't keep it because it's like doing something to her. She just has to, you know, spend it. She'd agree if she was sitting here tonight. But to me, I was more like conservative, keeping it to myself or maybe stashing it under the mattress, um, something in that, in that direction. But we, we differ regarding that. And before I further unpack this, oh wait, let me rather continue. So, so we have these, these different inclinations to working with, with money, for example. And um, specifically, coming regarding, you know, pocket money. So we were those, those guys that struggled to manage their money. Um, it burnt them, like, for instance, my, my sister that had a tough time keeping money or, uh, you know, working towards a certain goal. Then you get those who, like, miraculously at the age of six understood what it meant to save money and to actually accumulate money over a certain time towards a goal, to spending it on something and getting that gratification of waiting for something and, and working towards someone. So I don't know if there's anybody of you that, that are like that. I think Edwin sitting there might be someone like that. Chris too. So apparently, rumor has it that Chris too can tell you to the cent, every single cent that he has spent in his whole life. 
he's, a, he's, had, he's, account, he's got like an account to show that. So I don't know if there's anybody that has brought it to that extent. Anybody, maybe? Anybody close to that? Anybody like that, you know? Like to, to save their money and keep it together? We said Edwin. Okay, a couple, a couple of you around here. Okay, then you get those that are like impromptu. So I, I classify, classify myself more underneath this, you know, this bracket of you have your, you have your times that you're like, okay, you know, I'm taking this money um, and I'm saving it, you know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy myself that new cricket bat or hockey stick or whatever and, I, you know, I'm responsible with this. I'm, I'm getting that money and I'm keeping it on one side because I've got a goal to work to. But then on other occasions, I'm just like, boom, impromptu, just buying stuff. So I don't know if there's anybody of like, that are like that. You know, they have that heart to maybe like save sometimes, but then there are moments that it's just too much, you know. We can't, can't resist. So some of, some of them are like that. Then we have the crowd that, um, that never saw this money, you know. Um, f- for example, like, your parents are like, cool, here's your pocket money, but it's, it's not yours to keep. Anybody that, that, that have parents like that, maybe? There we go. So, so we all have different ways of relating to this, to this circumstance, and I'm going to unpack a scripture tonight, and I'm going to try and draw a line like a thread, a golden thread, through the descriptions that, that, we, that we we're speaking about now and this, and this scripture. And I'm reading out of, out of Matthew, Matthew 6, verse 19, um, 19 to 34, and we'll be breaking it into different portions. Are there any, any of you that attended this morning service when Christy was, was preaching? So him and I are preaching out of the same text so luckily, he was before me, so, you know, I could coin a few things over there. But anyway, here goes. So the first portion, so the, um, the heading of this, of this in the ESV is, um, you know, storing up, it, it, it kind of handles storing treasures on earth and in heaven, so it goes, it's about your heart. So don't lay up, your, lay up for yourselves treasures on earth when moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. I got a friend actually attending the service. His bicycle was stolen the other day on like the third floor of Patria. How is that even possible? Anyway, storing up treasures on earth where, where thieves can steal. And um, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. The eye is the lamp of the body. So this is Jesus speaking. So I don't know if you've read the Bible before, hopefully you have, but, but when we read accounts of Jesus writing, sometimes it's like in the, like red, written in red. So this is an instance of that. Okay, so the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, the whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light, if then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now one can, one, one can serve two masters, but either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So this is, this is quite straightforward. And what gets me, and I'm going to return to this later on in the sermon, is Jesus putting money right up next to God. Like... It must mean something, and if I'm not mistaken, there's, there's spoken about money in the Bible like a lot more than heaven and hell. Like money is, important, is an important thing to God. So, so yes, Jesus putting money right up next to, to God, and we're going to try and unpack that tonight to see what that might mean. So, so we start off and we, and we get this idea of laying treasures for yourself on earth versus laying treasures in heaven. And basically, we have a decision to make. Are we working towards a greater earthly reward or a greater heavenly reward? And what we need to understand is we make a decision now. Am am I going to engage in rewards that are earthly, that are now? Or, you know, rewards that that, that are heavenly? And whether you decide to do the one or the other, both of them have an eternal effect. So the decision you make regarding this is so important because it has an eternal effect on our lives. Forever it will influence us. 
So the heart in this case, out of a biblical reference, refers to the center of one's being. And to describe the center of one's being, the words, the three words that they, that they put down here for us is emotions, reason, and will. So that is the heart. And now, if we take that, emotions, reason, and will, and realize it is the center of our being, our hearts take a whole different meaning of the role it plays in our lives. And that should move us to a place where we can realize, listen, whatever we, we, we allow to take dominion of our hearts has a d drastic effect on our eternal well-being. Not just this that we feel now, but this that we're going to receive one day, the promises that we have, have, in, have in heaven. So the next portion of the scripture speaks about the eye being the lamp of the body. And out of history and out of Jewish literature, the heart, the eye and the heart are, 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 put, apart, are put next to each other. So the eye and the heart are seen as, as the same thing. And um, we, read, we later on read that this lamp reveals the quality of a person's inner, inner heart. So, so our eye that is a lamp onto our, that, that is a lamp, that is our heart as well, reveal more than just what is superficial, but this reveals the quality of a person's inner life. And what's crazy is that this might be an eternal condition, the quality of our heart, but our hearts are visible, although it's internal, it is visible, it's visible to those on the outside as well. So it might be something going on inside of us, but for those who discern and that are sensitive towards these things, and even those who don't, can very easily pick up the heart's condition of someone. And we don't realize this because we think it's an internal condition, but it plays out on the external as well. And then it goes on to the next portion that says, no one can serve two masters. And so the Greek word for this serve is doleo. And I don't know if I pronounced it correctly. Maybe I'll get a, a speech from Christu afterwards. I'm not very strong in Greek. But so the, this Greek word for serve is doleo, which means the work of a slave. So the, it's, this is different than an employee. So someone that works with someone within you know, uh, being an employee in an orga organization, someone that works for, um, for gooding, what's that word, compensation. So you work for compensation. That is different from a slave. And we read this and we read, we can't serve two masters. And these two, once again, are, are, are put up next to each other, God and money. So we're either doing the one or the other. And we're later gonna unpack this, this whole idea of money and, and you know, the heart behind that. So, so we can't be doing both. So you, off you in, off you on in. We, we read that, you know, you'll be devoted to the one or you'll despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So we should know that we are slaves to either, either one of them. And when we are, when we are slaves, um, we are the sole property of that which governs us. So this is crazy knowing that that whichever one we choose to pursue, that takes full ownership of our lives. And um, so I, I enjoy coffee and I've got a passion for serving coffee. I think I like serving coffee more than I like coffee itself. But I was reading, I was listening to this podcast the other day. Um, it's about the history of coffee and you know, we enjoy it as the sociable drink and this, this thing that connects people. But I was, I was quite struck when I started delving into the history of coffee, realizing that so much of, of the coffee we know now and the trade, the industry of coffee was built on the backbone of slavery. And that just shook me to know this. So, so yeah, I just, just wanted to add that, knowing that to get an idea of slavery, people being slaves to a master without giving consent and without compensation. And that's just something crazy and that should shake us regarding our thought and this whole process of our mind regarding us being slaves to God and um, you know, serving God without expecting anything in return. Um, you know, that, that art's position. So that it brings us back to this, that we are either slaves to God or slaves to money. So 
So I was mentioning these scenarios to you, and it was with intention. It wasn't just to, to bring us a, a giggle and a laugh. But I shared this because although these things are, are things that we, that we started learning from a young age, without us knowing, these things start forming us. You know, it starts shaping our perception of um, you know, the way we think about money, for instance. And money is the example used over here. But, but this, because it's a prominent example, but there are many things that can take the position, um, you know, on the throne of our hearts. And, you know, I don't know if you've got, you guys have seen, you know, once a child kind of, um, how can I put it? Uh, a child understands money in the sense of, okay, I can get money and I can buy stuff with it. I don't know if you guys have seen the change in a child's heart. You know, Krista always makes, he makes a joke, and Hilly always used to say it as well, but, but like, children are, wouldn't say evil, but, but, but they are evil. You know, children are evil because they're sinners just as we are sinners, except they can't really, you know, come into understanding of what they're doing. But, but I don't know if you've seen giving a, a child a 10 rand and how greedy they tend to get. And I think that's just such a good explanation or an example of our human nature because that doesn't necessarily change within us. Um, we just start filling ourselves with other things. And, it, you know, either in, in serving God or serving that need of, of wealth or money or whatever that might be. So, you know, ch children start understanding it and it changes them. And it might seem funny, but these primary foundations have a prolonged effect on the views we, we have on, on life later on. And, you know, our stance on money, and I'm, I'm 24, I'm turning 25 soon, and I don't know probably anything about money, but I've, I've tried to learn and I try to spend time with people that can equip me in a better understanding, people that have more experience than I have. So I'm not saying, yeah, I got everything figured out. I definitely don't have. But our stance on money and wealth is so, so important um, because it directly influences the way that we serve God uh, because this infiltrates our heart. Money and wealth and our understanding, our understanding of that. You know, the end of the script, this part of Scripture, verse 28, that says, we cannot serve God and money. Once again, I'm repeating myself because I feel this is of utmost importance to know that Jesus won't, won't for free just put these two things next to one another. It must mean something, something to him. And if it means something to him, it must mean something to us as followers of him. And, you know, if when allowed and not kept in check, our perception of this will govern our hearts. And once it gets a grip of our hearts, um, we see the image of a lamp. Um, it governs our life and it rules our life without even, even knowing. I always say that, you know, we are vessels and we are filled with, with, with stuff. You know, we get influenced and it changes us because we are vessels. And either we can decide what we want to fill ourselves with and um, it'll change our lives or we'll just stay stale and not take into consideration what, what we allow to influence our life, and we don't have to give that thing a second invitation or whatever it might be. It'll just take over our lives, and we should know this. We should know that whatever we allow and whatever we, we do not keep in check, we don't allow and do not keep in check, will govern our lives. And once again, Jesus weighs this up next to, next to God and the position that God can hold within our lives. And it sounds crazy, but for some of us, money, for example, has a higher place of authority in the hierarchy of our hearts. And I really feel that God wants to, wants to talk to us about this, specifically regarding this. Because we all, yeah, most of us have the privilege to be studying at the NWU. Or most of us students, Razor Van students over here. Okay, and we all are here currently with, for different reasons. You know, some of us are here because our parents just said we need to get something beyond our names. Some of us are here to, to kind of pursue maybe a sports career and um, just use this as a stepping stone. Some of us are here because we are chasing a dream. We are chasing something that God placed upon our hearts. You know, some of, some of us are here chasing wealth and money. You know, some of us are here chasing Lamborghinis. And some of us don't know what we're doing over here. And, um, but there's something driving us to commit to this. Okay? And we should know that whatever we channel this through, you know, is, whether it be wealth or just honoring God, 
it has an influence on, on our eternity. And more than that, except for the fact that it influences us as a person, when we start thinking about the generations to follow, the people that we have influence on, um, it has like this knock-on effect. It has this ripple, ripple effect um, influencing generation to generation to generation. But if we can sit here today and take into consideration the effects of this, um, it, could change, it could change our world. You know, if it changes our heart, it has the potential to change our world. And this leads us to the next section. So we read further on from verse 24 or 5. It says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you being anxious can add a single hour to this span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Awesome. I think we missed that last slide this morning. So that was Matthew 6, verse 25 to, to 34. So, so the heading of this scripture, for instance, is, is about you know being anxious about tomorrow and I, I believe that these things were handpicked to stand next to one another. You know, speaking about our treasures and then speaking about becoming anxious. And if we dissect the scripture a little bit, we get to know that scripture is really serious about this or puts it, puts it, puts it quite plainly that, that we don't need to worry. And specifically, if we make right decisions, if we make the correct decisions regarding us following Jesus and Jesus being in the middle of our, of our lives, we should know that we have no reason to be anxious. And when we come to a position where we are anxious, it kind of shows us a lack in trust and a lack in trust points to a, a shortage of faith. And a shortage of faith doesn't necessarily mean like a absence of faith, but sometimes a shortage of faith um, it's just as detrimental as an absence of faith. But we should know, just because, you know, we, some of us, we are believers, we follow Jesus, but we still have moments where we're anxious. Um, but we should, we should learn to, to align ourselves with God's will so much that we could know that without a doubt, we can make decisions that are right and that we don't need to be anxious about them. So, so grass is a, seen as a common biblical metaphor for, for human frailty. And it's, it's quite interesting because in the first part of this, the scripture, we read that, um, you know, God looks after us. And as far as my, my knowledge extends, we are the only creatures created in God's image. And knowing this and reading about grass that withers and seeing it as a metaphor for, for human frailty, we should know that even though we are made in God's image, we are still broken people. And that should point to a position of, God, we, I need you more in my life. Um, and I need you more in my life so I can be more like you. So I can walk completely in the calling you've called upon my life to, to live in the image of who you are. So we all have anxious moments in life. It is normal. Um, some of the, 
the most radical believers that I know have anxious moments in, our, in, in their life. I have anxious, anxious moments in my life. And um, it's, it's, part of, it's part of our human nature, I believe. And we have moments where we, where we fall short. Uh, well, we actually always fall short, but moments where we specifically um, just miss the mark regarding that. And um, I think when it comes to something like, like finances, for example, um, I have moments as well. I'm getting married in July. I've told you guys many times that I probably will until I get married again. Um, but, you know, I have moments where I feel, sure, I, I'm moving into a phase of my life that I've never been in before. And I don't know how it's going to pan out. But, you know, I have to hold on to, to the belief that I need to marry this lady. Most beautiful lady sitting in the front row. I think that's why I'm getting so hot. Um, and I just have to trust him in the process. You know, doesn't mean I'm not a, I'm not a believer. I'm not a follower of Jesus. Um, it just means I need to realign myself um, to see his promise in my life. And when we take this previous portion of scripture uh, and see the importance of the throne on which our hearts are placed, Specifically, when you read this, this last part, 25 to 34, we see that where and how our hearts lay influence the problems that we have and point, point to the reasons why things are making us anxious. And that brings me to the next point where I want to try and take things together. Reading the first portion of Scripture, reading about our, our hearts and you know, where, where our heart is, you know, where our treasure are, there's our heart. We see this, this image, and you can go to the next slide, Simone. We see this image of, um, of our heart's position. And then when we think about this next, next portion, speaking about us becoming anxious, us that have to have faith, us that have to trust, we see, you can go one back, please, Simone. Thank you. So we've got our heart's position in the first part of scripture, and in the second part of scripture, we see our heart's condition. And, you know, these are two, two different parts, but when we know we align our heart's position towards God, then we can know we set ourselves up for a good heart's condition. So these two don't always, I feel they are created to work together, but but sometimes we, we fall short. But if we know we have our heart's position in the correct place, we can, we can have faith that we set ourselves up for a good heart's condition. So the position is the, the, the place on the throne that it, that it takes up. And having God on the throne knows our hearts are in line with who He is. And when that is in line, we set ourselves up to steer free and, and steer away from things like anxiety and the things that, that, that kind of cripple us in this life. So we can achieve this and progress in this when we seek his kingdom. And that's, it's quite an interesting thing because, I mean, the scripture is, is so well known. It just says, but seek first the kingdom of God, 620, uh, 633. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added on to you. And, for, for example, Shanae and I, when I, when I had an engagement ring made, I engraved that scripture in the inside of the ring because um, we feel that's, you know, that's what we build our relationship upon. And it's such a beautiful scripture and it looks like the typical scripture for a wallpaper. And, uh, but it has so much meaning, so much, so much substance. And we should realize that to seek this kingdom, we need to know who the king is. Because if we don't know who the king of this kingdom is, we are missing it totally. Because how can we seek something or how can we seek someone that we don't know, that we don't know of? Um, and sometimes it's even, even worse in the direction of us seeking something or someone that we think is a certain thing and, and it is not. And I just feel that, you know, some of us, are here tonight, and they, we need to rearrange, you know, the order of this kingdom within our own lives, and what this kingdom means to us, and I get moments where I need to 
remind myself, you know, what is on, you know, the throne of my heart, what is sitting there. Sometimes it feels like God is falling off and then I have to, you know, pull it back up to get in in line. So we get moments like that and I, I follow Jesus. I, I feel I hear his voice and I'm obedient to his call on my life. But I have moments, you know, many of us following Jesus for a long time and we get moments. So, so it's, it's not about that. But I really feel there are people tonight that, that realize that this is a thing for the first time. You know, you've been reading the scripture of seeking his kingdom first and his righteousness and all else will be added on to us. And, and, and we need to, you know, I think we have this tendency to kind of think of this last portion of the, of, of the specific text that says, um, all these things will be added on to you. And then we're like, okay, um, now we'll seek his kingdom and his righteousness. And Christy mentioned this morning, you know, sometimes we, we, we take on something in life and then we pray that God will help us, you know. That classic, you know, pray after we've chosen to do it instead of other way around. You know, in this process, let's seek his kingdom and his righteousness and all else will be added on to you. For that matter, we don't even need to worry about all else that will be added on to you because it is, it is self-assured. God will provide for that when we seek his kingdom and his righteousness. And I really feel that, you know, um, God calls us to fresh revelations of who he is, and I believe that the kingdom of God is, is progressive, and it is ever advancing, and, and I feel when we say that we follow Jesus, that we need to position ourselves um, with that same ever advancing mindset of moving forward, moving with God, not standing still. Um, we had the privilege of joining in on, on harp and bowl training, that the people of IOP from America came and, and hosted a couple of weeks back. So IOP is the International House of Prayer um, where they just teach us how to s sit in God's presence regarding worship and prayer. And, um, you know, that whole idea of being on fire for Jesus took a whole new meaning in my life. Because in most instances in, in the Bible, from the New to the Old Testament, when we read about people getting close to God's presence, there is fire around there somewhere. And this is the same, same for this, you know. It's time for fresh revelation. I really feel God wants to impart fresh revelation on our lives, specifically regarding this. You know, that there are some of us that have an issue with our heart's position. There are things that are on the throne of our hearts in our lives that are not in line with who God is and who His character, who His character is and what His character says. And there are some of us, you know, we have... We have kind of control on that. We feel we're in a good place. I know my heart's position is correct. And I feel, you know, that's good. But man, I'm struggling with, with, with my condition. I know this truth over my life. I know what God says in his word, but I still have trouble to kind of come to grips of really letting go and knowing that God has us. And once again, for us to know that our heart's position and our heart's condition is in place, we need to seek his kingdom and his righteousness. And um, I'd like to pray for us. So if you guys wouldn't mind standing up together, the band can, can come on. Father, thank you for this moment. Thank you, Lord, that we just press into your presence, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you come and reveal to us tonight what our heart's position is. You know, what's on the throne of our hearts, Father. Thank you, Lord, that you come in this moment and reveal unto us where we lack regarding that, Lord. Where we have a misconception regarding that. Where we, we think we are doing something and following something, but in actual fact, we're not. So, Father, thank you, Lord, for, for coming to reveal that to us, our heart's position, Father. Thank you, Lord, that we can pray that you will come shine light on our heart's condition, Father. Father, where there are, there are moments of brokenness, Father, thank you, Lord, that we can know that within this heart condition, this heart's condition, Lord, you want to come and bring healing. And Lord, you want to come and bring, you know, consistency, steadfastness. I get this, this word of steadfastness. Father wants to come and bring steadfastness to our heart's condition. Everything in his character is consistent. Everything in his character is faithful. And now he wants our hearts to be aligned with that same character. 
Father, thank you, Lord, that I can just pray tonight and, and, and just feel that you want to impart a fresh revelation um, regarding your kingdom, Father. What your kingdom is, Father. How your kingdom looks in our lives, Lord. How your kingdom looks in our hearts, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we can just feel that you want to come and impart a fresh revelation regarding your righteousness, Father. And how we can position our hearts to seek your kingdom and to seek your righteousness, Father. And know that all else will be added unto us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we can know that when we seek your kingdom and your righteousness, Father, and we have a a full-blown pursuit of that, Father, we can know that you will align our heart's position, Father, and that you will align our heart's condition, Father. So I'd like to take this opportunity. If there are any of you tonight that feel my heart isn't in a good position I'm studying here and my, my intentions aren't in line with God's will I'd like to encourage you guys to stick up your hand there so we can pray together just a reminder of that anybody that feels your heart's position is not in line with God, what God has called you to thank you Lord that we can pray for that tonight thank you Lord that you come and, and position I see, I see this, this, the chest, this chest set being set up and I, I see you just perfecting every piece on that board, getting ready for battle. Thank you, Lord, that you come and align, come and align our heart's position. I'd like to pray for the, for the second group of people. They feel they, you know, they get this alignment and their hearts are on the right place, but they are so having a, a challenging time regarding their, their heart's condition. They can't help to have moments of anxiety regarding that, whether it be finance or security or their future. If there are any of you, I'd like to encourage you to to just put up your hand that we can pray together. Our heart's condition. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'll come speak to us regarding our heart's condition. So thank you, Lord, that I can pray for these individuals. Honor you for their boldness. I pray, Lord, that you'll just come and first of all reveal your heart, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that it'll be so in, so clear what they can follow, Lord, to condition their hearts, Father. Father, thank you, Lord, that we can know that you give the ample wisdom for us to nurture the condition of our hearts, Lord. So thank you for that. I feel there's a, there's a group of people here tonight that are just hungry for a fresh revelation of God's kingdom and, and His righteousness. So if there are any of you tonight that, that feel that, I want to encourage you to, to just raise up your hand so I can pray together. A fresh revelation of God's kingdom in your life and, and in, your, in your area, in your peer group, and what it means to, to seek His kingdom and His righteousness. So if there's anybody I'd like to pray for you, you can just raise your hand. Thank you, Father, that I can pray for these individuals that have put up their hand and just honor you for their, for their boldness, Father. Father, thank you, Lord, that you come and impart a fresh revelation of your kingdom and your righteousness, Father. Thank you, Lord, that we can just pray, Lord, that um, we will not walk out here tonight the same, Father. Thank you, Lord, that the imprint that, imprint that you make on our hearts, Father, is permanent, Father. Thank you, Lord, for being so good to us and for giving us your scriptures, Lord, that we can live by, Father. Thank you, Lord, that we can know that this is more than enough. Your scriptures and standing on your scriptures is more than enough, Father. Father, may the wisdom of this world grow dim, Father, in the presence of of your kingdom, Father, and of your righteousness, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ.